Hi folks, Dr. Travis McMacken here. Welcome or welcome back as the case may be. Thank you for choosing to spend a bit of your day with me. I hope that I can at least help you to think some interesting thoughts. I'll be back with you in a moment after the music ends. Today I'd like to share with you about the top five books that I read in 2019. So these are not um, objective judgments about the best books published in 2019 or anything like that. These are just the books that I read that jumped out at me the most and that added something new to my thinking uh, that wasn't there before or at least wasn't there before in the same way. And so I wanted to share with you all what these books were. Um, The first book is... Evangelicalism in America by Randall Balmer. It's a social history. It was published in 2019 by Baylor Press. And the whole book is good, um, reflecting on evangelicalism in American culture and where it came from and where it's going. One um, kind of meta theme in the book is how America needs more Baptists and not Baptists in the sense of the Southern Baptist Convention, but Baptists in the traditional sense, um, which Balmer sees passing from the scene, the sense that um, uh, is, is open to allowing different people to have their own private commitments and so on to the separation of church and state, etc. So that's kind of a, a meta theme, but uh, this book is worth the price of admission just for one of the chapters that's in here. It's chapter 8. The title is Recraft the Nation, the Religious Right in the Abortion Myth. It's a very, very important chapter. Um, as somebody who grew up within evangelicalism and then just watching the conversations and historiographies of evang- around and about evangelicalism, especially in the popular conscience, uh, there's this idea that the religious right and political evangelicalism came to power or came to influence motivated by concern over abortion. And what Balmer does is demonstrate in a very compelling way that this is a myth. It's a retcon, if you will, a looking back and fixing continuity errors in the story of the religious right. So uh, he tells us very carefully and lays it out uh, with a very good uh, timeline. But basically it goes something like this. You have desegregation and uh, the response of white Protestants in the South, especially to desegregation, is to set up private academies in connection with churches uh, so that they can carry on segregated education uh, just outside of the public schools. And this is uh, very explicit. They're they're called white-only academies. Um, and so there's, there's really no doubt about what's happening here in these schools. Now, as you move through the 70s, the IRS uh, gets wind of this and begins talking about removing the tax-exempt status of some of these institutions because of their segregationist policies. And um, things kind of come to a head when the IRS starts looking at Bob Jones University, as well as some other schools, and seriously contemplating withdrawing tax-exempt status. Now, an important figure in this story that you may not have heard of is Paul Weyrich. Or Weyrich. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. I have never heard of this guy before, and I grew up in the evangelical environment. But he was the political mover and shaker behind the rise of the religious right. And so I'm going to read just a short paragraph from page 116. The IRS pursuit of Bob Jones University and other schools may have captured the attention of evangelical leaders, but Weyrich was clever enough to realize that the political mobilization of evangelical and fundamentalist leaders represented only half of the equation. Unless these leaders could enlist rank-and-file evangelicals, Weyrich's dream of a politically conservative coalition of evangelicals would remain unfilled. And here is where abortion finally figures into the narrative. And that's the end of the quote. So basically what happened is the um, religious rights uh, leadership, or what would become the religious rights leadership, got all concerned by the threat of losing their tax-exempt status, which of course is a privilege, not a right. Uh, they get concerned about losing this because of their uh, racist, racist segregationist policies in these academies, but they have to convince all of the rank and file, the folks in the pews, uh, to go with them in this move. 
Now, Balmer documents that when uh, Roe versus Wade happened, there was not a widespread outcry against it from the evangelical community. It was kind of seen as a Catholic issue. And in fact, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, in the year after it came out, the ruling came down, um, seemed rather nonplussed by it. Um, and then you get this kind of political motivation where you're looking for an issue to galvanize the grassroots, and they landed on abortion, and they become pumping out, begin pumping out propaganda about abortion and riling up the grassroots so that they can build this cohesive political movement that was, again, remember this, this is the important bit, the whole movement was motivated by a concern to maintain racist segregation policies. So I'm going to read uh, the last couple paragraphs from the end of the chapter. Weyrich's prescience about expanding abortion from a preponderantly Catholic issue into an evangelical preoccupation was nothing short of brilliant. His success in blaming Carter for the IRS action against Christian schools may also have been brilliant, but it was also mendacious because Carter bore no responsibility for that. After years of warnings, the IRS finally rescinded the tax exemption of Bob Jones University on January 19, 1976, because of its persistent racist policies. That date, January 19, 1976, was a notable one for Jimmy Carter. Carter won the Iowa Precinct Caucuses on that date, his first major step toward capturing the Democratic presidential nomination. He took office as president a year, a year and a day later. Weyrick in the religious right, however, persuaded many evangelicals that Carter, not Gerald Ford, who was then president, was somehow responsible for this unconscionable assault on Christian schools. In Weyrick's words, quote, Jimmy Carter's intervention against the Christian schools, trying to deny them tax-exempt status on the basis of so-called de facto segregation, end quote, prompted preachers like Jerry Falwell to mobilize against him. For politically conservative evangelicals in the late 1970s, Jimmy Carter's refusal to seek a constitutional amendment banning abortion came to be seen as an unpardonable sin, despite his long-standing opposition to abortion and the efforts of his administration to limit the incidence of abortion. Carter, in fact, had a longer and more consistent record of opposing abortion than Ronald Reagan. The 1980 presidential election would test the mettle of this new coalition crafted by the hands of Weyrick, Falwell, Billings, and others. The nascent religious right courted several candidates in advance of the 1980 Republican primaries. The leaders of the religious right settled on Reagan, despite his episodic church attendance, his divorce and remarriage, and the fact that, as governor of California in 1967, he had signed into law the most liberal abortion bill in the nation. The politicking of the religious right, however, despite its unsavory origins, would help defeat Jimmy Carter, their fellow evangelical, and propel Reagan to the presidency. And that's where the chapter ends. So we have here a story of racist commitments uh, motivating uh, conservative uh, evangelical Protestants and white Protestants in the United States to support a candidate uh, with a great deal of very significant personal failings uh, and hiding uh, the true motivation for that support under a myth about a moral issue. And if that isn't, uh, and if what we're living through uh, more recently isn't history repeating itself in those terms, I don't know what is. So that's Random Ball Randall Balmer, Evangelicalism in America. And I'm taking these books in um, alphabetical order. This isn't necessarily a ranking by any means. Now, the second book uh, is The Insecurity on Freedom, Essays on Human Existence by Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, if you are not aware, Heschel was a very important uh, American rabbi in the middle of the 20th century. This uh, collection of essays was published in 1967, and the essays come from uh, the decade or so, arranged across the decade or so before that. And uh, I really have enjoyed reading more Heschel, a uh, very insightful uh, thinker, and uh, was really active in the civil rights movement, um, was uh, friends with Niebuhr and pushed Niebuhr to be more vocal in support of civil rights and the black freedom movement, uh, walked in uh, a number of the demonstrations, a number of the key demonstrations, uh, was friends with um, Martin Luther King Jr. and so on. Uh, the first section I want to address here, I mean, these essays cover all kinds of things, and the one I'm looking at right now is called Children and Youth, and it's about education. And what he has to say about education in the Jewish tradition, I think, is really powerful, and, and it uh, kind of gets at the 
it kind of highlights what we've lost to a certain extent in the way we approach education today in a very technocratic society. So I'm going to dive in here and read some Heschel to you, so quoting from page 42. According to an ancient Hebrew saying, the world rests upon three pillars, upon learning, upon worship, and upon charity. In our civilization, these pillars become instruments. Learning is pursued in order to attain power. Charity is done not because it is holy, but it, because it is useful for public relations. And the supreme object of our worship and adoration is our own ego. Power is an instrument, not the end of living. Learning, worship, charity are ends, not means. It is wrong to define education as preparation for life. Learning is life, a supreme experience of living, a climax of existence. And so he goes on from there to talk about how the teacher is more than a technician and a school is a sanctuary, not a factory. And I really enjoy what he says at the top of page 43. So quoting again. The meaning of existence is found in the experience of education. Termination of education is the beginning of despair. Every person bears a responsibility for the legacy of the past as well as the burden of the future. Ending quote. So just some, some real aspirational words there about the importance of education. Heschel also has some essays on racism in this book. A number of them were addresses at various kinds of conferences. So now I'm going to quote a little bit from page 86 to give you a flavor of uh, what he has to say here. He says, Raci racism is worse than idolatry. Racism is Satanism, unmitigated evil. Few of us seem to realize how insidious, how radical, how universal and evil racism is. Few of us realize that racism is man's gravest threat to man, the maximum of hatred for a minimum of reason, the maximum of cruelty for a minimum of thinking. And then he goes on from there uh, to answer the question, what is an idol? And I think this is um, a great answer to the question, what is an idol? Quote, any God who is mine but not yours, any God concerned with me but not with you, is an idol, end quote. And then finally, um, he talks about forgiveness and forgiveness of sin in relationship with God. And he brings out an interesting strand of the Jewish tradition here that we also see in um, the New Testament in connection with the Lord's Prayer. It's also embodied in the rituals around Yom Kippur in uh, rabbinic uh, Judaism. But Heschel says, quote, It is not within the power of God to forgive the sins committed toward men. We must first ask for forgiveness of those whom society has wronged before asking for the forgiveness of God, end quote. And I think that is such a powerful reorientation of our thinking. What would it mean if we became convinced, as Heschel was, that there's something wrong with our relationship with God? There's some barrier there between us and God so long as we have not been reconciled with our fellow human beings. And that could provide the basis for a, a widespread reorientation. And we see this, like I said, in uh, the Yom Kippur ritual in Judaism, where you uh, do need to go speak to those uh, with whom, in the community with whom your relationship has broken down in the past year before you can uh, take part in all of those um, ritual activities. And also in the Lord's Prayer, where uh, Jesus has us pray, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Um, so this idea that, and, and my, my teacher, George Hunsinger, who's going to feature on the list in just a moment, always said in class, and I'm sure he still does say, that all sins are against God, but some sins are exclusively against God. And those sins that are not exclusively against God are what Hi Heschel is highlighting here. So the, the lack of reconciliation, the breakdown of relationship uh, with those around us is also a breakdown in relationship with God. And what does that say for society in a society where those relationships are woefully broken down? So that's uh, a little bit about Abraham Joshua Heschel and his book, The Insecurity of Freedom. Uh, I mentioned Hunsinger. The third book on my list is 
Hunsinger's second edition of his book, Karl Barth and Radical Politics. This was published, the second edition was published recently in 2017. I'm trying to remember what the original publication date was. I think it was 1976, but don't quote me on that. So it's been a while to get into the second edition, but I'm very glad that it has because this book is full of great material. For instance, there's a wonderful essay in here from Helmut Golwitzer. It's a kind of redacted version of the German essay, which is longer, but it's called The Kingdom of God and Socialism in the Theology of Karl Barth. Uh, has been hugely influential for my thinking, so that's a great piece. Also, um, Dieter Schellung uh, on reading Karl Barth from the left, uh, wonderful appreciation and criticism of Barth. Um, Joseph Bettis from the context of the United States, political theology and social eth ethics, the socialist humanism of Karl Barth. Bettis makes the argument that the reason that Barth has not been properly received in English language theology is ultimately the way capitalism warps our perception of his theology, and I think Bettis is spot on about that. So lots of great stuff in here. Uh, also, in this second edition, uh, George has included a number of his relevant essays that have been published in other places, uh, so it's great to have them brought together. I especially like uh, his essay on Karl Barth and liberation theology. So I recommend, I don't want to dive into too much detail in this book. I've talked about it before. I've quoted uh, from this book in the first and second edition, both on uh, online and in my own writings. And so I, I won't belabor it, but it is well worth uh, your time and resources to pick up a copy of that book and drink deeply from that well. So moving on to the uh, fourth book on my list, this is uh, entitled Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, and it's by Manning Marable. Uh, and this book I read over the summer primarily on vacation and thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm looking for the publication date for you. Uh, 2011 is the copyright of this paperback edition. Um, I read Malcolm X's autobiography, and um, I'm a savvy enough reader, and I know enough, that I was able to identify that there were layers in that narrative, um, that it wasn't uh, exactly an objective, uh, historical, uh, academic kind of narrative, and that there were a lot of different interests going into how the narrative was shaped, not least uh, Malcolm X's own changing interests over the course of producing that volume uh, with his uh, co-writer who had his own uh, interests. So I, I knew enough and could see enough to identify that there were layers there, kind of like in the Pentateuch, uh, where you can identify the seams between the different sources, but it really takes a lot of specialized knowledge to dig in there and tease those seams apart in an expert way. And that's what Manning Marable does in this book. Um, and Marable knows the period forward and backwards. He's a real expert on uh, the black freedom movement, the civil rights movement, um, and he, he keeps in front of your eyes as you're reading all of the other things that's going on, even down to the month. Uh, he'll often pause in his narrative and say things like, now remember, this is the same month that this other thing happened, and that's influencing the situation in this way, which I found to be very, very, very helpful. Just a couple things uh, in greater detail that I took away from the book. Uh, one is is a central irony, uh, as Marable calls it in Malcolm's life, about his powers of perception. And I wonder how often uh, this is true in everyone's life, that uh, we are very gifted at perceiving certain kinds of things and then also very bad at perceiving other kinds of things. I know that it's true in my life. I suspect it's more widely true. But here's how Marable puts it with respect to Malcolm X uh, in his own life. Quote, the central irony of Malcolm's career was that his critical powers of observation, so important in fashioning his dynamic public addresses, virtually disappeared in his mundane evaluations of those in his day-to-day -day personal circle. Especially in the final years of his life, nearly every individual he trusted would betray that trust. End quote. Well, that's a little poignant, a little bittersweet, but probably a good reminder uh, to us all. Then finally, I wanted to highlight, and I'm sorry, that was from page um, 
268. And now on page 336, I want to highlight uh, some economic aspects of Malcolm X's program. And this is something that Malcolm came to later in his life. So I'm talking about, or I'm reading from Marable talking about um, a speech that Malcolm gave in 1964. And remember, he was assassinated in 1965. Um, the greatest significance from this speech, uh, Marable tells us, was, quote, a profound change in Malcolm's economic program. For years, he had preached the Garvey-endorsed virtues of entrepreneurial capitalism. But here, when asked what kind of political and economic system he wanted, he observed that, quoting Malcolm, all of the countries that are emerging today from under colonialism are turning towards socialism. I don't think that's an accident, end quote. For the first time, he publicly made the connection between racial oppression and capitalism, saying, quote, It's impossible for a white person to believe in capitalism and not believe in racism, end quote. Conversely, he noted those who had a strong personal commitment to racial equality were usually, quote, socialists or their political philosophy is socialism, end quote. What Malcolm seemed to be saying was that the black freedom movement, which up to that point had focused on legal rights and legislative reforms, would ultimately have to take aim at America's private enterprise system. He drew an analogy to farm fowls to make his point, quote, It is impossible for the chicken to produce a duck egg, even though they both belong to the same family of fowl. The system in this country cannot produce freedom for an Afro-American. And if ever a chicken did produce a duck egg, I'm quite sure you would say it was certainly a revolutionary chicken. End quote. So I find it interesting that Malcolm begins making this term, turn later in his life. It was nothing that he did uh, systematically or consistently from that point on, but he began to make these connections. And um, from what I know of Malcolm, which admittedly isn't a ton, uh, he seemed like the sort of person who made these intuitive uh, connections. He was really, really insightful but intuitive connections and then um, struggled to integrate them into uh, a coherent system sometimes. But I also find it interesting that this is toward the end of his life. He ends up uh, being killed about a year later and then we see, and, and James Cone has teased this out, we see uh, Martin Luther King Jr. making a similar turn toward criticism of capitalism uh, in the year or two before he ended up being assassinated. Of course, Malcolm was assassinated by um, Nation of Islam actors uh, primarily, and um, Martin Luther King Jr. was not. Uh, so different circumstances there, but nonetheless interesting to me that socialism and criticism of capitalism specifically makes an appearance at the end of both of their stories. Now, the final book on my list is called The World of Caffeine, The Science and Culture of the World's Most Popular Drug. And this was published in 2001. It's written by Bennett Allen Weinberg and Bonnie K. Beeler. And this is a book that I found uh, as part of my teaching in interdisciplinary studies. I offered a course in the spring of 2019 on drugs and medicine, uh, where we really tried to think about how we identify the line uh, between these two things. And caffeine was one of the, the test cases that I, I wanted the students to take a deep dive in and think about, you know, is this a drug? Is this a medicine? Uh, and how do we treat this uh, psychoactive substance as a culture? But a number of interesting things emerged for me as I read this really compelling social history. And it's a large book with a lot of information. Uh, it took me a, a long time to kind of work my way through it, but I, I enjoyed it immensely. But uh, coffee and uh, caffeine consumption emerged in Europe in the early modern period, just as economies were shifting from primarily agrarian to primarily industrial. And so they make the book that the primary application for caffeine or coffee in Europe seemed to be, quote, in helping us to work when it is required that we do so, end quote. So as, as uh, the economy shifted, no longer was it uh, working in the cycle of the seasons, uh, working uh, when the work needed to be done, punctuated by considerable periods of less intense work. Um, it was more a daily and weekly grind, the sort of schedules that we are all accustomed to today. And I know that in my own life, coffee's primary virtue, the reason I consume caffeine, is so that I can work when it is necessary for me to work. And uh, another interesting thing, 
as they elaborate later. Uh, so what I just read was on page 98, and I'm jumping ahead now to page 125 and following, is that the classical and medieval worlds did not have a stimulant drug. They actually had um, conscience-altering uh, substances that emerged in the context of alchemy, but they did not have a stimulant like caffeine. So it's hard for us to imagine all of these uh, pre-modern folks functioning without a stimulant drug. I mean, imagine Thomas Aquinas without the benefit of coffee or Augustine. How did these people produce the amount of work that they produced without the benefits of a stimulant when it's, as, as they note here, quote, it's difficult to imagine what modern life would be like without it. So this underscores the point that um, we have kind of crafted a way of being in the world in the, in the modern period, especially in the West, that's predicated upon having a certain kind of psychoactive substance and having easy access to it in considerable quantities. And also they point out another interesting connection is that um, coffee and caffeine hit Europe at about the same time that clocks were invented. So as soon as we're able to begin reliably regulating time and measuring time, and of course that gets taken up into all kinds of economic applications, it's at that moment that Europe discovers this psychoactive stimulant caffeine. And I think that's a really interesting connection. And so thinking about uh, the way that we've crafted society and built it, basically built society, modern society, on the back of a psychoactive substance, um, toward the end of the book they raise the question, is caffeine a drug of abuse? Because so many people use it to such a great extent. So this is on page 307. And they ask a question that I think is one of the most fundamental questions that faces uh, how we think about psychoactive substances. It says, quote, if an entire society accepts a pattern of drug use, is that use by definition a normal one? End quote. So to what extent are our attitudes about these substances uh, simply predicated upon social judgments and social utility and even economic utility? Uh, is there, in fact, a hard and fast uh, moral line with the use of psychoactive substances? Frankly, I become uh, increasingly unconvinced that there is, uh, precisely because uh, looking at the history of these psychoactive substances, caffeine and alcoholic uh, beverages and all the other substances and what got deployed where. We see all the political aspects involved. We see that um, in the West, the substances of choice among the elites tend to remain legal and the substances uh, that were much more uh, trafficked by lower classes were restricted uh, and things of that nature. And, and the modern state in many ways is built on tax revenue uh, connected to uh, psychoactive substances. So uh, there's there's layers and layers and layers here that I think are ultimately fascinating in that book, The World of Caffeine, is a good entry point into it. And if any of you uh, enjoy caffeine, uh, whether because of the stimulating effect it has on you, I drink it just for the effect. I'm not a particular fan of the taste, but I know folks who love the taste and claim not to get much of an effect. Uh, this would be a book that would probably interest you. Get it, put it on your coffee table, put it on your nightstand, read a few pages of it now, and then you'll find it interesting, uh, as I did. So those are my top five books that I read in 2019. I'm looking forward to see what, seeing what 2020 will bring, the start of a new decade. Uh, and so you can look forward, I hope, to another installment next year. In the meantime, thanks for listening. You've been listening to the McCracken Cast. I am and hopefully will remain Dr. Travis McMacken. I do all the production work myself, in case you couldn't tell, but the music is by my son, Connor. Until next time, think interesting thoughts. Thank you.